in the Shan Hills of Burma, close to the China border, there's a leper colony, almost completely isolated from the outside world. But its fame has spread beyond the mountains and across the frontiers. And the people come, walking often for weeks and months. They're outcasts, not permitted to live among their fellow men because they are lepers and children of lepers. They live on what they manage to pick or kill in the jungle around. Berries, insects, wild plants. Huts made of branches help protect against the monsoon rains and chill mountain nights. They bring little with them. They have little to bring but their pain and hope that at the end of the road there will be help. Ahead lies Kang Tung Leprosy Colony. For those who live here, for hundreds of miles around, Kang Tung Colony has come to be known as the Happy City. this road before. Now I was returning to a people and a place like no other in the world. What I will tell you of this place is true. What you see is what I saw, heard, felt. a welcome such as this. Many years had passed, but we had not forgotten each other. Could I ever forget these faces? But I remembered differently. There were so many now. And what had become of the stained and filthy rags? The vacant stares of despair? Where was the decaying flesh? the anguished cries of the leper. Some miracle had happened since last we met so many years before. A holiday had been declared and a program carefully prepared weeks in advance. I sat with Father Colombo, my friend, the colony's architect, doctor, priest, bricklayer, and blacksmith. The Council of Headmen read the official speech of welcome. Then old and special friends were presented, according to their custom. I had known Inan as a leper six years before. Now she was well and married, living in a nearby village. One child named William for me, the other Caesar for Father Colombo. The gifts began with trays of bananas, baby food, and betel nuts. Rice, eggs, matches. Hoarded for months. The best of what they had. I would have to find a way of returning it all without appearing ungrateful. What could I do with a chicken? But all of this was not for me alone. They could see and hear and touch me. They could not see and say what they felt for the many Americans who had helped this once grim and ugly place of pain become the happy city.
The show began with the children, children of lepers, most of them born here in the colony. But leprosy will not invade these healthy little bodies if he can help it. The costumes, made by the sisters from cloth sent from the States. A bit of bright cloth and a straw hat to lift the spirits. For the children, for all of Kang Tung's people, as good as any medicine, I thought. There are several different tribes and religions, too, in the colony. Shans, Ikaws, Kachins, Buddhists, Catholics, Protestants. Each tribe in its traditional costume would try to outdo the other in inventiveness. And the show went on and on. Father Colombo brought in the bullocks which had been fattened for the feast. Once or twice a year, he's able to provide meat for the colony. They were tied where all could see and admire them for a few hours and sympathize with their inevitable end. Two bullocks will provide a few ounces of meat for each of the 1,500 people of Kang Tung Colony. Nothing will be left. Everything is eaten, including the skin. Meat is a luxury in a place where there's usually not even enough rice to go around. The colony depends completely on rice for its sustenance. The problem of providing sufficient food for survival is one he faces daily. The feast was soon underway. I wondered how long they had been on short rations saving for all of this. I marveled at the way they looked. Pa Shen was a pretty girl by anyone's standards, yet she was a leper. I worried about Father Colombo. He looked so tired, but it would be useless to say, take care of yourself. There was no self. It had been a long and wonderful day. As night fell suddenly over the hills, the curfew bell told its warning. For with darkness, there was danger now. The joy of the day was gone, and in its place was fear as people hurried to their houses. Hidden in the hills beyond, in the jungle and darkness, were marauding guerrilla bands. Terrorists, insurgents, communists, and others bent on revolution, on separating the Shan states from the Union of Burma. The Burmese troops, nine or 10 of them assigned to duty in the colony, took up their positions for the night. Father Colombo secured the doors. His army gathered. A hundred lepers armed with ancient flintlock rifles prepared for jungle patrol to stand guard outside while the colony slept. Be careful now. Take no chances. Fire only if you must. Do you have enough food and blankets? 
Send a message if you need me. I watched the valiant little detachment move out to watch and wait for the enemy. There were mornings when they did not all come back. A deep and anxious stillness hung now over the colony. Colombo's army took up positions in the jungle. But what could gorillas want from lepers? Food, medicine, guns, money, blankets. Anyone to kill so that others would be afraid and obey. Terror was the weapon. This is how war works. Burma style. At midnight, Father Colombo made his rounds to see that all was well. That this place should have to face terror from without. What strange irony, I thought. In the morning, we walked through the colony. There were so many new things he wanted me to see. New families to meet. Look at this face, he would say. It was so distorted a year ago, you wouldn't have recognized it. Isn't it marvelous what the new leprosy drugs can do? Look at her face. Wonderful improvement. But I wish we'd been able to do something sooner. He was so proud of their progress. Of life returning to paralyzed hands. Of the children. He was proud of the way they had learned to work. Timber for building must be soaked for a year or more before it can be used. The soaking discourages termites and other insects which would quickly destroy a building. The men are paid for their work. It's not really necessary and the amount is very small. But Father Colombo believes that it is important in maintaining morale and helping them feel less like outcasts and more like useful, needed, honest workmen. They were building a storehouse for the rice. Colombo, the master carpenter and patient teacher, providing strength and experience where it was needed, teaching a craft to a people who knew little more than how to build a bamboo hut when they came here teaching skills by which they can live when they leave here. From a nearby lake comes the mud to make bricks. They've experimented for years with methods and techniques, different kinds of earth, trying to make bricks which will last, which will not crumble back into earth again with the rain. As important as what they are accomplishing is the fact that the will to learn, to work, to build has been given to a people often without even the will to live when they came here. It took three years to make and bake enough bricks for the colony's proudest accomplishment, the new hospital. I'd often see him stop for a moment to gaze and admire it as if it were something marvelous to behold. And indeed it was, built by the people themselves, every block and brick made here in the colony. The money from America, the work by the lepers. Cooperation. For 15 years he had operated outside under the sun, 
because there was no shelter clean enough and with light enough for surgery and no means of building one. Now at last there was an operating room and a proper table to lay a patient on. He had trained the sisters himself to assist at all kinds of surgery. This was a simple appendectomy. Beyond the table itself and instruments, there's yet no other equipment in the hospital, not even beds. But the building at least is here, and perhaps the rest will come. Besides surgeon, he's also pediatrician. It's always a fight to keep them well, but much more of a problem to find space food and medicine for the hordes who have heard of the happy city and come streaming in. Lepers down from China, from all over Burma. They have been cast out as unclean. From home, family and friends. As in biblical times, cast out as lepers. These, only a handful of the 12 million forgotten, hidden, uncared for lepers in the world today who can be cured. He would take care of them all if he could. Where have you come from? How long have you been traveling? The touch of his hand offers hope that their journey can be over where they cannot return to the place from whence they have come. Feed them, sister. Find them some place to sleep for tonight. We'll have to see what can be done. When last I visited here, I did not see how he could take in another single person. Yet in six years, the colony has doubled in population. But how to feed them? Already the rice ration is cut to survival limits. How to cure them? What to do? So little to do with. Somehow he manages, takes care of them all, and Kang Tung flourishes. They gathered on the porch of the dispensary the next morning and waited. He examined them one by one. The disease in its early stages here. Spots on the face and on the back. Little damage yet to muscles or nerves. At last, in the 20th century AD, man has found the way, the drugs, to combat and eradicate forever this ancient curse. Careful medical records are begun. In a year, the spots will have disappeared if she can be kept here, nourished and treated. Father Colombo and the sisters have vowed to remain here for life, to do just that. If help comes in time, the disease can do little damage. But useless hands and feet and bone cannot be restored. Among the newcomers is one addicted to opium. The poppy grows freely in this part of Asia. The tiny pasty ball of raw opium is heated and placed in the pipe. A 
few deep drafts, and there is no pain, no hunger. Only dreams of a heaven full of rice. The council of head men of the colony know of the opium smoker. They have decided that somehow they will find rice and make room for the new ones. But an opium addict cannot be allowed. One addicted is a sorrow to his family, a problem and a threat to the peace of the happy city. But I can stop any time, they always plead. You can't do it by yourself. It's impossible. I'll help you if you'll try. Otherwise, you must leave. I Pan knows what lies ahead. For ten days, he will stay here, confined. of struggle, of torture, of mental and physical pain almost beyond imagining. subsides, but it will return. Understanding and mild sedatives will help him through what is to come, and he will triumph, as have the others who have gone before him. There is a new home for children, which was not here when last I knew this place. His recreation is a few minutes each day with the baby. Before the nursery was built, children born in the colony were sent out to live with foster families. Few survived. 92% died before they were three. Now it is different. Children are separated from their parents to avoid possible contagion but kept here in the colony, given anti-leprosy vaccine, loving care. And they have every chance of growing into normal, healthy adults. The child mortality rate has dramatically reversed itself. Now, over 95% live. Sister Maria cares for over 250 children in the nursery. The problem of getting three-year-olds to take a nap seems to be the same the world over. I wondered, though, what would have become of these children if this building were not here? Would they be among the 92% to die? I suspected they would. How much life depended upon a board floor and a roof, I thought. There was a sudden baby boom in progress. Over a hundred born in the last 10 months. The question now was where to put them all. The new nursery already hopelessly inadequate. The care and love they provided in abundance. But babies need much more than this. They were running out of baskets and blankets, out of bottles and nipples. Every rag available served as a diaper. They howled and screamed like babies everywhere. They ate and slept peacefully. 
not knowing how much their lives depended upon providence on help from people they would never see or perhaps even hear of. Sister Maria and Sister Serafina make the formula twice a day and live in fear of that day when the shipment of powdered milk does not arrive because there is nothing else to feed the babies. Washing diapers goes on endlessly. But perhaps even more needed than a washing machine are better means to educate the growing number of children. They cannot be sent forth from here as illiterates. There must be a real school, a full-time teacher and books. But all of this must wait until still more pressing problems are dealt with. In paddy fields a few miles from the colony, Ex-lepers prepare the land for the new rice. Men who no longer show signs of active leprosy, who appear to be cured, who are able to work. Some place must be found for them to live. Something given them to do, since never again can most return to their villages to take up life as they left it. Near the paddy, is a village composed of these people. Several satellite villages like this one have been established for people well enough to go out from the colony to make room for others. There are now nearly as many people in these outside villages as there are in the colony itself. I cannot abandon them to starvation and reinfection when they leave, Father Colombo says. And so he organizes a village supplies food and medicines to get them started. There's still his patients under observation and care. The doctor wants to be certain that the new drugs really cure, not merely arrest the disease. It will take time to tell. Besides the colony in these satellite villages, Dr. Colombo also cares for the people of the town of Kangtung which is the capital and market center for this whole vast area of the Eastern Shan states. Every morning at seven, he visits the dispensary. The people arrive before daybreak and crowd the examination room. There is the usual malaria, malnutrition, a variety of tropical diseases and disorders. Sometimes leprosy is detected in its early stages among those who are not even yet aware that they have the disease. In Kangtung town, there are many things to look after. Certainly his most difficult single problem is providing rice for the colony. There is a bit of help from the government, but hardly a tenth of what is needed. The rice merchants extend credit, but a time of reckoning always comes, and he must plead for more time and more rice. He borrows money from one merchant to pay another, robs Peter to pay Paul. He said to me one day, if they ever all catch up with me, I'll spend the rest of my days in jail. But for another reason, this is a real possibility. All vehicles are stopped and searched. Aiding the terrorists is punishable by death. The area is a war zone. Bullet carts constantly smuggle food and arms to the insurgents. Villagers who are now considered insurgents have been his friends for years. They need him too. He treats them. But this is treason.
While a colony sleeps, you'll find him still at work at his desk, keeping medical records up to date, always studying. He learned medicine in this room. Later, after two years of study in an Italian hospital, he was able to pass the examination for an MD. There are letters to write, letters of appeal and thanks to people overseas who help. He sleeps three hours and 24, and often this is interrupted. I would look out of my window in the small hours and see him in the moonlight carrying a syringe of morphine to someone in pain. Threats from the insurgents continued, sometimes dramatic. One letter contained a bullet, which meant there would be killing. A feather, which said it would be quick. The charcoal was obvious. The colony would be burned to the ground unless demands for money and food were met. A knock at the door meant he was needed in the jungle. Someone was hurt. guards killed, two insurgents captured. There were several funerals during my days here. Grief and a terrible sense of loss would descend upon us all. Each life here was desperately fought for and hard won. This was not the way to see one end. His grief was greatest of all, for they were his children. I worried, as I knew he worried, about who would bury them when he was no longer here. There was no one. Was there another man like this man? To be sure, he will live here forever. But what will it be like when the voice is stilled and there is only the memory to guide King Tung Colony? Per misericordia un dei, richieste di in pace. Amen. When the time came, I wasn't quite ready to leave. But my life and work was not here. My two weeks were over. I might never return. I knew it. They knew it, and we wished it were not so.
I said goodbye to the sisters and perhaps for the last time looked through those soft, deep eyes into that noble heart. I was leaving the happy city, but I would carry its joy and sadness with me always. And I hoped something of the spirit of Colombo of Kangtung.